previously at Chester Zoo. Tejas, the lion cub, had the splints taken off his deformed legs. Okay. So splint out the way. But had the treatment worked? Um, it might be too early. We may have to put the dressings back on. Today, Vet James examines Tejas. Where's your Uncle James? Will the bandages have to go back on, or is he he's, cured? Uh, he's a lot more steady on his legs. It's amazing, really. Headkeeper Andy prepares to do battle with some baby-faced baddies. They look very sort of fluffy, cute animals, but uh, they're not. <laughs> right, so some bodies in there for this. And it's all hands to the pump when a Babarusa pig refuses to go to sleep. I've been involved in sedating ten Babarusas now. No, this definitely has been the, the hardest one. Asiatic Lion House, a soccer the male and his mate Asher have been let out for the day. <sighs> Indoors, headkeeper Alan Woodward is taking their two-month-old cub Tejas to be examined by resident vet James Chatterton. Where's your Uncle James? <laughs> It was James and Alan who took the decision to remove Tejas from his mother when it became clear she wasn't feeding him or his brother. If we leave them in there, I think they're going to die, you know? So we need to take them out and rear them. The other cub did die when he was only a few days old. But Alan drew on his 35 years' experience to make sure Tejas survived. Then came a shattering blow. OK, Papa. Let's put it on the ground, see how you walk. Vets discovered he had something seriously wrong with his front legs and couldn't walk properly. Wrists are tall, talking on his tiptoes. He was diagnosed as having tight tendons. Yes. Yep. His legs were put in splints to try to correct the problem without the need for major surgery. Careful. <laughs> it's now three days since the bandages were taken off and James has come to examine him to see if there's any major change in his condition. We were concerned that his front right leg wasn't quite perfect yet, so uh, the condition he's got may continue to improve without the, without the bandages being on. Um, so, yeah, there's two things we're doing today. One is we're deciding how his legs are, are doing and whether we need to re-bandage them, basically re reapply his, his support bandages. And then the second thing we're going to do is vaccinate him. Okay. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. There we go. There. So I've got your number. <laughs> I remember that face. Oh. The painful part over. Okay. There we go. Alan is anxious to take Tejas back to his den so that James can see if there's any improvement in his walk. He's walking much better. He's, he's still. He's not quite a hundred percent on that front right, and he's not falling over anymore. No, he's moving much better, and I think he's moving even better than he was on, on Friday afternoon. So I think if we give him another day or two with, without the and then sort of the like assess him, say, and then we we'll reassess him on Wednesday. Okay. I think what we want is for if, if obviously we want the condition to carry on improving because he's not quite perfect. He's no. dramatically better than he sure. dramatically improved. Well, on I'm what hoping he was. by having somebody in with him every day, keeping him sort of occupied and exercising, he's going to stretch it even that more. A exactly, and and, yes. and the exercise on on the, the rubber flooring is going to going to do those legs the world sure. of good, really. Yeah. But I mean, to look at him now, he's he's, he's a different animal, isn't he? Really? Yeah, he looks happy, and he, yeah. he's. I yeah. think they were, they were saying that he's, he was sat back in his back legs to take the weight off his front legs because they were a bit sore and I, yeah. I think that's proven true because he's now standing up properly on his hind limbs too. Less like a ball of fluff and more like a lion now. I was really worried about him. And not be long before he gets to go outside and see the big wide world and... Chase the pigeons. Yeah, <laughs> cause havoc amongst anything in his that's, enclosure, that's I would it. imagine. Yeah. It's really good to see. No, I can't see Even at his tender age, Tejas's future is being carefully mapped out. 
If he gets a clean bill of health, he'll go to a zoo in France, where he's wanted for an Asiatic lion breeding program. I admire Tej the loss because, I mean, he's, he's been through such a loss and, and he bounces back every time. Um, I dread the day now when he's going to go. Um, I think of it a lot now. Um, he, he looks to me a lot, he looks towards the team a lot. And, uh, but then that's another stage of growing up. I mean, we can't stay together forever. Um, and he has to become a lion and, and look after himself sometime. But it, it's, it's good for him in the end anyway. In France, when Tejas grows up, he'll be mated with a female in the hope that he'll father a new generation of Asiatic lions. And if he's to do that, he'll need all the beauty sleep he can get. Chester Zoo's newly arrived Indonesian male Babarusa pig is in need of some serious dental work. Sasu's tusks have become so overgrown he's in danger of stabbing himself in the head. Uh, okay. The tusks uh. are in urgent need of trimming. But to do the job safely, he must first be given a full anaesthetic. Yeah. Zoo vet Steve Unwin has been called in. He plans to inject the pig okay. with the aid of a dart gun. Anaesthetic goes on the top here, and the needles are specially shaped so there's a hole on the side rather than on the end. Um, so the, the dart is under pressure, so there's air in here. So when it um, hits the animal, it goes into the muscle and pushes this, that, that little cuff back and the drug will go under pressure uh, into the muscle and the animal will hopefully go to sleep. OK, little man, you stay there. It's actually more difficult to try and dart an animal in this close space because the, the, the gun's designed for a, a longer, longer distance. And I could have used a blowpipe, but I just get more control with this. Went in first time, went off lovely. So I'll just leave him quietly now to go to sleep. 15 minutes and keep an eye on him, but won't disturb him, just keep it quiet. Steve keeps watch through a window. A few minutes later, the anaesthetic begins to That's take effect. The most risky part of any anaesthetic um, is uh, when you induce them, when they go to sleep and when they wake up. So they need to be monitored fairly closely. And, and he is a new animal to the zoo, and as far as we're aware from his medical records, he's never had an anaesthetic before. So, um, uh, oh, yes, he's fallen over. <laughs> so if, 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 if every animal will react differently to the same sort of dose of anaesthetic. And um, I didn't think at the beginning that um, the dart had gone in terribly far, um, which could be a bit of a problem because the uptake of the anaesthetic could be a bit slower. How long have we been? We've been 10 minutes. I don't, think that, I don't think it went in very far. As time passes, Sasu shows little signs of nodding off. Steve decides to give him a second dose of the drug. Oh, he's well out of it, but not totally asleep. Okay. The vet retrieves the original dart and discovers why it didn't work properly. You can see here, it's gone in okay, but it's only gone in about, you can see where the hole is, that's where the drug would have come out of. Um, so some of it may have got, we say, come subcutaneously, which is just underneath the skin. So um, it sedated him, but uh, made him not quite deep enough for us to be able to handle yet. He hasn't had his breakfast, he's probably not happy now we've jabbed him. <laughs> All they can do is wait. Later on, Sasu finally falls asleep and Tim gets to work with the cheese wire. There's your wire. <sighs> <laughs> Headkeeper of primates, Andy Lenahan, has come to give the zoo's colony of ruffed lemurs their morning feed. Like the more familiar ring-tailed lemurs, these animals come from the rainforests of Madagascar. But there, the similarity between the two species ends. Ruffed lemurs can be highly aggressive. This is a family group, and Andy has worked with them since they were born. We've got 
10 in this group. There's um, mum, dad and eight offspring. They've all been given names from the keepers, but the mother and father are called steak and kidney. I don't know. Don't ask me who named them that, but uh, someone had a bit of a brainstorm and named them that at the time. The female is aggressive all year round, very aggressive, so we lock her out whenever we're doing something. The male gets a bit of a dog's life, really, from, from his uh, spouse and also his daughters. But we've got four males uh, leaving tomorrow for a zoo down in Suffolk. Because they have young every year as well, which again is unlike a lot of the other monkeys and the apes. Um, it's sort of a bit like an assembly line, so you've just got to keep churning them out and, and sending them off to the other zoos. So it's quite a hard job finding homes year after year after year. You end up flooding the market with them. Catching the lemurs promises to be a tricky and potentially dangerous job. The difference with these is they're, they're very, very strong and they act very differently to ringtail lemurs when you're catching them. If you grab their tails, they just turn on you to try and bite you instantly, so you can't really do that with the rough lemurs. That sound we're hearing now, we just heard, that's the call of the rough lemurs. A lot of people, a lot of visitors hear it from a from long way away in the zoo and they come running up here thinking it's a fight breaking out. It's not. They, they look very sort of fluffy, cute animals, but uh, they're not. <laughs> the four males that are going to another zoo are due to leave tomorrow. It's going to be a hectic day for the primate team. At Chester Zoo, Sasu, the Indonesian Babarusa pig, has finally fallen asleep. Headkeeper Tim Rowlands doesn't want to risk waking him by moving him. He's decided to trim the pig's tusks on the spot. In the wild, the tusks would snap off naturally as the animal roots around the forest floor for food. If I keep blowing on him, it might start a fire. Just trying to keep the dust from out of his eyes. Tim is slicing through the tusks using cheese wire. He's actually calmed down a lot now. Yeah, we can carry him after yeah, this. Yeah. There's your wire. Ah. There you go. <laughs> now you go to sleep. Yeah. The risks are far from over. Sasu could injure himself or his keepers as he recovers from the anaesthetic. Yeah. Right, set some bodies in there for this. <laughs> the team decide to move him to a safer place. Ready? Yeah. One, two, three, slide. That's going to be going. No, 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 just on his back We're going to see him. Yeah. We're going to be able to see him. That's please. fine. Vet Steve Unwin gives him a reversal injection to bring him round. It takes five people to keep Sasu pinned down to stop him staggering around and hurting himself. Because it didn't go according to plan A, we went to plan B, which we'd already organised. So we did him, did his teeth in there, and now because we gave him the reversal a little earlier than we would have normally have done. We want to make sure that he's not going to get up too quickly and start staggering around. These guys are fairly notorious for coming around badly, so we're trying to make sure that he's down long enough a, for the reversal to kick in and be that he'll have full coordination. They decide to leave him alone and let him come round in his own good time. If he can get himself into some sort of recovery position then much happier with that. He shouldn't injure himself now. I mean, he's in a padded um, off-show pen. Um, he's got a deep bed in the corner. Um, it doesn't matter how much you put straw over the whole area, he's going to move it around and he's still going to hit the floor. So he's on rubber matting. He's got soft wood all the way around the side. So he's just got to get used to it and get his feet find his feet um, so he can stand properly. And the best thing we can do for him now is sort of be quiet, leave him, leave him alone, and just have one person watching him off the monitors. Later on, things go from bad to worse as Sasu struggles to find his feet. He's either had far too much to drink 
or he's been on the roundabout and spun around too fast for too long. At Flamingo Lake, the old Flamingo House, with its outdated facilities, has been demolished to make way for a new state-of-the-art building. Headkeeper Wayne McLeod is delighted with the way it's taking shape. With the keepers involved from the very start, we, we know what the birds' requirements are. Yeah, it's amazing when you see it all come together. This is the Hilton Hotel for flamingos, believe me. Put a plasma screen in the corner and I'll be happy to move in here, yeah? Although Wayne's pleased, he's finding it stressful as the builders race to complete the house before winter sets in. We're worried at the minute because if we get any freezes, uh, the problem is the birds are hardy enough, the, the cold weather won't, won't bother them. We've got an electric hot wire running around the enclosure and that's ticking over at 5,000 volts. That is there solely to keep foxes out because if a fox was to get into the enclosure, it would kill not just one but possibly, you know, 10, 15 birds. So the problem we've got, if we get a freeze, Basically, a fox could hop over the electric fence and get into the enclosure. So, you know, panic stations at the minute. The guys have thrown this up in six weeks. We're, we're near completion, we've got another week or two, and hopefully we don't get any cold weather in that time. Foxes aren't the only danger the flamingos face. If the lake freezes, they also risk slipping on the ice, breaking their fragile legs and wings. It's a nightmare, a nightmare. You see a clear night, and you're thinking, oh God, I hope that pond doesn't freeze tonight. It usually takes a couple of them cold nights to get the water to actually freeze, because you need the water temperature to drop. And it's, we've been lucky, when we've had a clear night, the next day's been quite, quite warm. Well, I just hope these guys can get this finished off before, well, in a, in a week or two, because they're, they're working dawn till dusk on it, they've done really well. The builders will continue working as fast as they can. All Wayne can do is keep his fingers crossed for mild weather until it's finished. Visitors have begun arriving to see Chester's newest attraction, a baby tapir. She's just 24 hours old and senior keeper Helen Massey has come to make sure she's OK. Pregnancy in a... Tapir is 13 months, which is quite a long time, considering that um, rhinos are 15 months, and then you've got the other extreme of deer and antelope, which is usually seven or eight months. So it's, it's a long time coming, but definitely worth it. Tapirs are natives of South America and distant relatives of the rhino and the horse. Helen's delighted to see that mum Jennifer and dad Cusco are taking good care of the baby. Jennifer's a very good mum and dad's also a good dad. Um, I was cleaning them out this morning and they were both taking it in turns to come in and check on the baby and then yeah, they just kept swapping around all the time. She's still a bit wobbly on her legs. She's been pushed around quite a lot by mum, being told where to go. And obviously the markings are great. All the babies have stripes up until they're about nine months old, just for camouflage, really, because obviously they won't move around very much, so they need to keep hidden. Some people say that the baby tapirs look like mint humbugs, they're, uh, which, which is true. They're very stripy and it's the brown and cream colour. Really good description of them. The baby will be allowed out in a day or two. It's been several hours since Sasu, the Babarusa pig, had his tusks trimmed. But he's still suffering from the effects of the anaesthetic. His whole world is spinning, so he can't keep his feet. He's either had far too much to drink, or he's been on the roundabout and spun around too fast for too long, so he just can't, can't get his feet together. These guys fight it from the moment they're injected to the moment they're completely round. So their way of fighting it is to get up and get moving, even if their legs aren't capable of taking that. So it looks a lot worse than it actually is. I've been involved in sedating 10 baboosas now, I think, at the zoo. Um, 
most of them for hoof trimming in adult males and this probably is no, this definitely has been the, the hardest one. It's not going as smoothly as the others, but he's a new animal um, and we'll learn from this exactly what dosage will work with him. Um, he just didn't go down as easily as some of the others, but uh, the outcome will be the same, it'll be good. Sasu will stay in his padded stall overnight. Only when he's fully recovered and steady on his feet will he be allowed back to his own enclosure. Next time, headkeeper Isolde holds her breath as boy meets girl. Unfortunately, it takes time to develop with reptiles. It's not always love at first sight. It's more love at first fright. <laughs> Wayne hears the news he's been dreading. Smooth radio weather for the Northwest. Freezing weather, a chance of more frost and ice following last night's really cold weather. Uh, today's maximum seven degrees. Again this evening, below freezing, wrap up nice and warm. The weather forecast signals a dramatic race against the clock to get the flamingos safely inside their new home. Go on! Go on! No, they're going to come out. <laughs>